Welcome to The Beacon and good morning. My name is Kevin Wilson and I am your host today. Thanks for tuning in. We do appreciate it. This is Dominion Payroll's ongoing webinar series where we bring insights and perspectives from around the, the business community to help you understand the challenges uh, that, that face us today as we, we operate our businesses and serve our employees. Um, from legislative update, updates to uh, industry spotlights, we try to bring you perspectives and stories that you wouldn't normally have access to and really help shine a light on the often volatile and ambiguous challenges of running a business today. I'm incredibly excited to welcome um, our panel this morning. But before I introduce them, just a couple housekeeping measures. Um, if you do have any questions for our guests today, please drop those in the Q&A. Um, I will do my best to incorporate those into the conversation. Um, we ask that you avoid the chat. Um, we do record these um, for folks to view later, um, host them on our website. And so the Q&A plays nicely with that and the chat disappears into the ether um, when we, we end the recording. Um, speaking of our website, we do encourage you to please go to dominionpayroll.com and hit that uh, COVID-19 resource button at the top of the homepage. That'll take you to a list of all of our upcoming webinars, HR Matters, legislative updates, and future episodes of The Beacon. You can get registered there. You can also view all of the resources that we've uh, put together to help you navigate the CARES Act and FFCRA and, I don't know, the, the alphabet soup that uh, we've been swimming in for a year now. Um, so that is at dominionpayroll.com. And of course, uh, we're always here for you. So should you have any questions about HR matters, payroll, running your business, uh, reach out to us at questions at dominionpayroll.com and we are happy to uh, assist you as best we can. All right, without further ado, let's jump into today's topic. Today, we're looking at the state of brick and mortar restaurants and retailers. Um, we're gonna explore the impact of uh, some technologies that have really come to the forefront um, in widespread adoption over the last year, looking at third-party delivery apps, payment platforms, We'll be looking at changing consumer behaviors and expectations, the hiring challenges um, that exist in the market right now, and, and the potential for pent-up demand. I hear every economist saying pent-up demand. Um, and I think that the next two quarters might be uh, a return to the roaring 2020s. Um, so that is, that is our topic today. I'm incredibly excited to welcome our guests. Um, we have uh, Tim Carter joining us from uh, Salsarita's Fresh Mexican Grill. Tim is the CFO, has 15 plus years experience in the food and beverage industry with a focus on franchising. And Salsarita's is a, a big franchised operation. Uh, they operate uh, about a dozen of the Salsarita's concepts um, in about four states and they have a total of 80 locations operating in 17 states. Tim, uh, thanks so much for joining us today and for lending uh, some of your insight and perspective. Happy to be here. All right, next up, I'm uh, pleased to introduce Jeff Van Horn. Jeff is the owner of Lucky Road Run Shop. Um, opened in 2012, has grown to three shops in Central Virginia. Jeff's a former All-American runner. Plagued by injury, he set out to uh, figure out how to operate a run shop that would both uh, help elite athletes alongside um, the casual jogger. I count myself in, in that uh, camp, um, but I, I always aspire towards those, uh, you know, $250 uh, things that are guaranteed to make me get that six minute mile. Um, Jeff, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And just a, a note, um, Dave Gallagher, unfortunately, was unable. He had a last minute scheduling conflict. And so the uh, CEO of Dominion Payroll and the uh, co-founder of Tang and Biscuit Social Club um, will not be able to join us today, but uh, couldn't ask for uh, better company as we uh, jump into this topic. Um, Jeff, I'd, I'd love to start with you. I tried to do a, a good job with, um, you know, sort of a, a bio and an intro there, but um, it, it's always best to, to hear directly from the owner. Um, tell us a little bit about Lucky Road uh, Run Shop and you know, your, your journey over the last decade um, as you've developed these stores. Oh man, how much time you got? Because it's a story. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I was, I, was, uh, I was told not too long ago that uh, if I were to write a book on my life, most people wouldn't believe it. So um, That sounds like a life worth living. Well, believe it or not, Lucky Road Run Shop is actually my second venture into the run specialty industry. Um, I started my first store in 1999. So this actually marks year 22 uh, as being a store owner here in Central Virginia. Um, 
And anyway, were just some things that came up in, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that uh, a little outside of my control. And I just felt the need to start over. So um, created a whole new company, um, new concept. Uh, well, basically the same concept, just a new kind of face to it and, and uh, called it Lucky Road Run Shop. Um, Irish themed running store. Um, mom, my mom's first, uh, first generation Irish American. And it just seemed kind of fun to have a store named Lucky. Lucky anything really, um, but Lucky Road Run Shop. And, and we, um, uh, I mean, I recognized years ago that uh, uh, my purpose in life is to help people, uh, developed a passion uh, for just kind of putting it out there and trying to help people. And um, with the degree in sports medicine, my love of running, um, it just kind of, this concept just allowed me to do that and also be my own boss, you know, make a living doing something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, but what we really focus on is just helping people, uh, whether the person's an elite athlete or not it's, not, it's not relevant. The majority of people that actually need our, need us or need our services are the middle to back of the Packers. And, uh, I appreciate what you had to say, um, about, uh, you know, being one of the back of Packers slower runners. But, and I was asked recently, you know, if I run and, and I had to think about it cause I'm not sure I qualify anymore. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm just, you know. I trudge along like anybody else does. But what we do know is that um, uh, even back of the package, even the slow people, even people are just, you know, getting out there for whatever the reason, they, they're they going to encounter the exact same challenges as the people that are trying to break records. Uh, injury issues, training issues, um, met, you know, just mental toughness issues. And we've just put ourselves in a position to be able to help them. Um, so, and, and I, and I love it. So I'll keep doing it for as long as it's fun. I love it. Um, I, I think that, I, I mean, you really hit on a, a key sort of red thread that I think we'll, we'll talk about throughout this conversation, but it's that, it's that personal relationship that you develop with your clientele, um, and that desire to give them, you know, a unique experience and, and, and as you said, to help them. Um, I think that, um, Tim will probably sort of second that if he talks about the experiences that he tries, uh, his company tries to provide at Salsaritas. Um, Tim, give us a little background on, on the concept of Salsaritas and, and your journey into uh, 2020 and 2021. Sure. Um, so Salsaritas is uh, headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. And, um, you know, you covered our, our stats as far as uh, where we operate. Um, you know, we're, uh, I've been with the company for 14 years now. I'm, I'm actually the, the old guy in the office, uh, even though I'm not the oldest in the office. But, uh, I've, I've been here the longest and, and certainly feel a lot of ownership, even though you know, I'm not a, a owner of the company, but um, I, I work with the owner on a daily basis. And uh, it's been an interesting challenge uh, with him, you know, safely quarantining his home in Virginia and, and me here in Charlotte. It's, uh, we've gotten very familiar uh, working on screens. Um, the, um, the concept is a fast casual Mexican restaurant. Uh, that's industry lingo, but uh, uh, we compete head to head with uh, Chipotle, Cadoba, Moe's, uh, in, in that sort of format. Um, the restaurants were were built for, you know, somebody coming into the restaurant, working their way down the line, building their meal, uh, customizing it to their tastes, um, and of course that led to some interesting challenges when people were no longer coming into the restaurant and telling us what they wanted. Uh, they were getting their computer to do it for us. Um, so uh, it, it, you know, we used to to say that. And the Great Recession was the, the big challenge that we lived through and, and, and came through as, as a small restaurant company. And uh, now 2020 has definitely taken that mantle uh, as, as the, the biggest challenge we've faced uh, professionally. Um, but it's, uh, it's made us, you know, it, it really is one of those, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, flip side of that is the guys that got killed don't get to comment, but uh, the, uh, it's, uh, I think we're stronger off for it and, and our, our business is definitely forever changed. Um, so it's uh, look forward to getting into some of the nitty gritty. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I want to sort of start with um, exactly what you just referred to is, you know, it, it's been a, a challenging year by all measures. Um, you know, one that in, in March of 2020, I don't think any of us um, expected to, uh, to still sort of be in the thick of it. Um, and I, I think most operators, you know, they had to, they had to, there, there was a, a get up and just do it for a long period of time, sort of a reactionary stance. Let's just figure it out day to day. 
And you know, now the, with the advantage of, of a little time, a little distance, um, I think we're at a spot where maybe we can start learning a little lessons and synthesizing what we've just been through. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, I'm, I want to turn to you. Can you tell us uh, you know, what are some of the things that, um, that you've done at Lucky Road um, to, uh, to, to adjust to you know, some of the constraints on how you're able to operate, how you're able to interact with your clientele? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, it's an interesting question about adjusting because from the very beginning, um, you know, I had a conversation with my wife, who's actually my business partner, uh, and I honestly couldn't have asked for anybody better to help me with this. Uh, you know, uh, when I was a single dad trying to run a business, uh, we had a certain uh, vibe in the store, but, you know, Desiree came along and, and really classed up the joint, so to speak. Uh, so we're way better with her on board than when I was trying to handle it myself. But um, no, just the conversation with her was that like, look, you know, everybody, every, every indication that this is only temporary um, and I don't see any need to really make any massive changes or adjustments to anything that we're doing. I mean, everything's on a temporary uh, time frame. Uh, you know, talking a year ago. And I just remember looking at her and saying, look, we don't need to be a leader and we don't need to be a follower. We just need to be who we are. We just need to steady on. We need to project consistency uh, to our client base out in the community that we're not going anywhere. We're going to be here and we're going to keep it as normal as possible. Uh, now, obviously, um, things went on much further than we were initially told they would. And, and we did have to make adjustments. And um, I can tell you, going over every aspect of our of our business um looking at every minute detail of expenses and finding ways to be more efficient um was something we probably should have done anyway uh we found all kinds of waste um and, and every little bit helped uh but one of the big things that we did was we actually adjusted our hours slightly now um there was a lot of talk in in where you know in virginia about um the governor's mandate you know, who, who's a, uh, um, or what's the word, the businesses that are essential, right. essential businesses versus not essential. And I'll tell you, and then we read the first paragraph, my heart sunk, because I thought, oh, we're done. That's it. Um, but I made the point of reading the whole thing. And when you get another paragraph or so down, the governor explained what non-essential can do to remain open. And we read that and we're like, okay, we, we can do that. And we made a point to keep our doors open. But one of the things we figured out by adjusting our hours from 10 to 7 um, to being a low, open 11 to 6, uh, that shaped two hours a day off, um, allowed our staff to have some rest time. Um, we were able to focus our efforts on making sure that our full-time employees got exactly what they needed to survive. I mean, they and they do. What we have is a family, okay? This is not your typical, you know, employee, uh, employer relationship. Everybody in our organization is considered family. Um, we take care of them. We know that they're going to take care of us. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it just works its way around. Um, if you look out for your people, they'll, they'll look out for you too. Um, and that goes for employees or clients. But... Um, we focused our biggest attention on trying to make sure that the people who relied on us for their living, um, they got what they needed. And so by cutting our hours, um, two hours a day, we found that we were able to shave a, uh, a lot off of our, um, off of our payroll, yeah. uh, on, on a, uh, biweekly to monthly to yearly basis, um, without hurting anybody, we were actually able to start giving raises, um, oh. by focusing on the full-time people. And, and that allowed us a little more continuity, in our processes in the store, the customer interactions. Um, I mean, that's probably the biggest change that we made that, that affected us in a positive way. And our clients adjusted. Yeah. Uh, we finally got it, it uh, you know, set up on all the social media platforms and, and uh, our website about what our hours are. And, and I jokingly, you know, say, hey, they're COVID hours. When we get back to normal, you know, when the world get back to normal, we'll go back to normal. Uh, I'm thinking we're just going to keep our hours the way they are. It's actually working out that our client base recognizes that we're only open a certain amount of hours and they're adjusting their schedules to come in and visit with us. And, and our, our sales are actually up um, and we're, we're poised to have a significant year. That's fantastic to hear, you know, and I, I think that um, there's that phrase, you know, don't let a, a, a good tragedy um, get wasted, you know. Um, and if it does involve that that hard look in the mirror and say, hey, what are our practices? You know, why, why are we doing it this way? Um, and and one, one point that you made there is um, 
knowing who you are, you know, knowing who you serve and, and, and really just being true to that and distilling that essence away from, you know, is it an arbitrary, you know, amount of time that we're open or is it, you know, are we doing certain things um, just because we always have, but, yeah. you know, if, if we can commit um, to that, that, you know, that'll better serve our, our whole mission. Well, I wish I could remember who said it, and I'm probably not going to give it proper credit, but um, to adjust a little bit, somebody made the quote and, and to adjust it to my business. I, I'm not in the shoe business uh, serving people. We're in the people business serving shoes. And, and if we change, if you can change your focus to not focusing on money, not focusing on the sale, not focusing on what the product is, but focusing on what your client's needs are, taking time taking the time to really get to know your client, identify their needs and going above and beyond to try and fulfill those needs. You're making people happy. They're going to have a great experience. They're going to want to come back. Love it. That's, that's great. Um, you know, one, of the silver linings, one of the silver linings for this, if you know, if we're looking for those now is, uh, you know, when the world turned upside down, it, it wasn't just our business. It was all society. And so our customers, we learned were, you know, they were okay with some oddity and some, some inconvenience and some, you know, uh, weird arrangement just because everybody was going through that and, and they were more forgiving than I think we anticipated they would be. Uh, and that was kind of comforting and it made sure. some of the weird stuff we were having to do and, and needing to do a little more palatable. Yeah, Tim, let me, let me sort of stick with that. You know, it, it, the restaurant industry, you know, is, has, has, you know, some would say brutal margins where you, you're trying to squeeze every, every penny out of every, you know, head of lettuce. Um, you know, how have you had the opportunity to sort of take a, a, a deep dive on some of your operating procedures? And, you know, have you, have you guys found a way to operate more efficiently um, over this last year? Yeah, the, uh, and, and, you know the post uh, restaurant business has been the poster child of this uh, of this uh, pandemic, um, mostly in the media. I, you know, I, I think there's plenty of other businesses that were impacted just as much and in just in very similar ways. Um, you know, I, I think about like bank tellers and and uh, you know grocery workers, but uh, you know the restaurants were everybody could understand it. So that was what the, that's what led the media uh, narrative, but. Uh, you know, it's we spent most of 2020 in a cash burn position, um, but you know, we really focused on you know narrowing that burn every single day um, to where you know PPP definitely helped. Uh, I can say without PPP one, we definitely you know it would have been a much much uglier year. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, so that you know that was that was helpful, um, but. Our, our entire sales dynamic shifted um, to, and, and you know, the, we'll probably get there to online ordering and, and third party ordering. You know, we, we were already heading in that direction before the pandemic. We'd already been putting in about a year's worth of work to get the technology uh, underpinnings for that put in yeah. place. But we, what we'd anticipated would be like a three year transition in customer behavior happened in about a week. Yeah. And that was the, um, that was the big shock, I think, uh, was, you know, we went from serving customers who were standing in front of us to serving customers who were, you know, in the internet and, and, you know, who we would never see face to face. And, uh, that's a big shift in, when you're in the hospitality business. Um, you know, the assumption sure. is I'm going to be hospitable to you face to face. And, and now you're just, uh, a, a signal from the internet. Uh, right. and, you know, how do we carry our brand standards through to that? How do we, uh, um, make sure just overcome the logistics of getting food to, to somebody and, you know, that's still tasty and warm and looks edible. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that's an ongoing process. We have, I'm not saying we've, we've figured that out, but, uh, um, it's, it's been a big transition for us. Uh, and we had to, I think one of the biggest things we tried during, uh, you know, we tried everything. We would, anything we could find, it looked like somebody wanted to buy, like we threw it out there. We probably did more, you know, used to be, we'd think about a limited time offer and it'd take us six months to put it all together, get it collateralized, roll it out through the system. We were throwing stuff out, you know, in four days uh, yeah. just to say, okay, let's try selling six taco packs. Let's try and sell in 12 taco packs. Uh, you know, let's uh, recontainerize our family program and, and our family meal pack and, and uh, push that, you know, through social media and just reacting and trying different things. Um, and, and at this point, 
you know, we look at our business in terms of um, catering sales, which is a, a fifth of our business, and then non-catering sales, which is made up of dine-in, take-out, third-party online. That portion of the business, the non-catering portion of the business, is actually now positive over our 2019 numbers. Wow. Um, so, you know, we, we actually built new business. Now, without the catering, with catering still being gone, you know, we're, we're net negative still, but... Um, but the but trend is in the right direction. The trend is in the right direction. And, and we built new business during the middle of this uh, calamity, um, you know, by, by pivoting to what people want and, and whatever, you know, they, they'll express what they want by placing an order. Right. <laughs> you just, you just got to try it. Yeah. It's a strong signal, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and recognize the opportunity to this there. Yeah. If you start getting enough requests for something, you, you, uh, you try to adjust and, and, uh, and see if you can make that happen. And then, and then you determine if it's valuable, if, if there's a, uh, if there's return on that investment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, in, in the thick of it, we're just, you know, cash flow in that investment would be great. You know, if, yeah. if, uh, we, well, if we were selling something at a low margin, I don't, we were selling. So that, that was good enough for today. Um, well, yeah. Cash in is, is king. You know, yeah. that, and I don't know what you guys did, but I know when, when, uh, when it, when it hit the fan here um, and we're looking at, uh, you know, poised in, tw in 2020 to have a phenomenal year, we had actually beefed up our inventory about 30%. And then, and then sales went down 30%. And we we're sitting on all this excess inventory. Mm -hmm. And the bills were coming due. And, um, and I was like, well, if, if, uh, if my vendors want my money, they're going to have to work out some arrangements, because I'm not just going to start writing checks. Yeah. Right? So, you know, we had to sit down and, and have a conversation with every everybody that we did business with, um, and let them know that we're just, we're not just going to, you know, start giving up our cash reserves. We want to survive this. And in order to do so, we had to hoard our cash and work out payment plans with everybody that we worked with. And, yeah. and fortunately, fortunately, they understood that there's a partnership there too. Um, so we didn't find anybody that was demanding. Um, everybody was understanding and they were willing to work with us. Um, and, and unfortunately it, it all worked out without us having to, having to really borrow anything to get through it. You know, that's that's great to hear. I um I you know we we hear that phrase we're all in this together, but you know um, sometimes it's easy to dismiss that as like, you know a tagline to sell Toyotas, um, you know rather than you know an actual example where people are saying no like you know we we collectively are all hurting and and if we if we do band together we'll get to the other side of this in one piece. Um, yeah, well, clearly some, some people were hurting more than others and, and yeah, you know, we might be all in it together, but some people are in the yacht and some of us are wearing the dinghy. So <laughs> being, being dragged behind, um, fighting the waves. And we, uh, had thing. We, had, we had vendors approaching us, you know, saying, Hey, you know, let's, let's, let's extend your credit. You know, I know what you're going through right now. Uh, and that, that was really surprising and touching. We had vendors on the other side of the spectrum too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, we had a we had a vendor, and I and I won't name names, but you know, a vendor that we do really really well with, that I was a little dismayed. Um, and, and Grant, I understand why they did this, but they um they gave out I I don't know how many tens of thousands of uh, of shoes um, to to a certain segment of our society as as a as an act of good faith. And yes, it worked very well for marketing. I'm sure they could have written that off, but. You know, as I was sitting there looking at it, it's like, well, if they had just taken their top vendors and said, okay, well, we're going to slash X amount off what you owe us, I think that would have done a world world of better good for, you know, our partnership. Yeah. Um, you know, granted, that probably makes me look greedy, um, but if they really wanted to help within the industry, I, I felt that at the time, it probably would have been a better idea to maybe forgive debt than, than go take, you know, like, you know, $500,000 worth of product and just give it away to people who could have come to the store and bought it. Yeah. Um, I want to, I want to turn to the, uh, the topic of, of technology. You know, a lot of folks have, have said that, you know, the, this last year has moved us forward five to 10 years in terms of adoption of, you know, new tech, um, the way that it sort of saturated our lives in a way that was, that was present in 2019 and is omnipresent now. Um, you know, Jeff, as you've operated Lucky Road, um, you know, have you found that your clientele are looking for, um, you know, how, how are they responding to that pressures, uh, the pressures of like online retail and having that digital presence um, when you also offer such like a, a in-person experience as well? 
That's a, I'll tell you what, that's a great question. And online retail is nothing new. Um, it's, it's been a growing segment of, of our industry because uh, we're, we're dealing with, with goods. Uh, um, and honestly, to a lot of people out there, shoes are just shoes and you can get them almost anywhere. And that's why it's so important, you know, to survive in this category, you've got to be a little special. You've got to, you've got to create a, a wonderful experience for people to make them want to come back, make them want to be associated with us. And so, uh, you know, we've been able to survive and I've been fighting the good fight against corporatization of, of our industry um, with the big change taken over and, or at least trying to take over. We, we've been holding our ground and we're still, you know, we're still uh, the best in our area. Um, but there were some, definitely some things that came up as, as people were then, you know, told not to go out or afraid to go out, um, that we had to start offering up different things like uh, curbside service. Uh, if somebody wanted to call and place an order, we've got their record. Yeah, we can put that together, put it in the bag, meet you at the curb. Um, we've had others that, um, uh, you know, was like, hey, can you ship? And I was like, well, it's not something that we're really set up for, but I will be happy to come deliver it to your house. So, uh, you know, doing our best to make sure that we had our full-time people taken care of. Um, there really was no need for me to be in the stores. I had a lot of free time. So I literally drove and made hand deliveries to people's homes myself. Um, it. And, and it was kind of heartwarming that they would then post the pictures of the shoes sitting on their doorstep with our, with our logoed bag and put that on social media. And that, that definitely felt good. Um, that's great. But, uh, That's great. But little things like that. And I can tell you that in terms of fighting the good fight against um, the corporatization and, um, you know, trying to develop an online site, uh, well, communication was another part of it. We, I found myself communicating with people more through email, uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, you know, there was dozens and dozens of questions coming in on a regular basis. We had to be available and on, on my cell phone. Um, you know, almost all the time to answer, you know, people's uh, concerns. Um, but we finally did, uh, and I say break, I'll say breakdown. I finally did break down and we, we developed the method to be able to sell uh, our inventory online. And the only reason the, uh, that I agreed to do that, um, because it, again, I think it's counterintuitive to who we are and what we're really trying to accomplish by having that personal relationship with our client. But the only reason I agreed to do that is that statistics are showing that a certain segment of, of, of uh, consumers, they will come to run specialty for their first pair of running shoes, but a rather large percentage will go online and purchase their second just out of convenience. Yeah. And so in agreeing to have our website set up that'll have a, uh, a shop option it's so that we have an opportunity uh, to compete for that business as well and get, hopefully give people another reason to want to come back and support us. All right. Yeah, no, I think that that's, um, I mean, that's, that's a great example of sort of preserving that, you know, the, the essence of who you are, but, but also meeting your consumers where they are. And there's an opportunity in that. Um, Tim, well, I was adamantly against it. I, I mean, when we were first approached with this concept back, you know, in the summer, I was like, hell no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> That's not who we are. It's not what we do. Um, but, uh, you know, more information you get, I, your minds can be changed. And, uh, and my mind changed. And, yeah. I, and I, saw, I saw the benefit um, uh, to, to having an online presence to sell product. Um, and, and I think the, uh, you know, after only a couple of months, we're already above break even on, on that aspect of it. Uh, so there is there is a return on that investment. I think it'll only grow. But yeah, it was counterintuitive to everything that I've ever said about who we are and what we want to do and what this industry should be. Yeah. Um, but it does it gives me an op it gives us it gives us Lucky Road op an opportunity uh, to keep our clients. For sure, Tim. I, I want to stay with that question, but uh, you know, I think it's it's slightly different in in a restaurant space. Um, where you know you can make inventory decisions based on having 25 seats. Um, when you go to online, you know everybody within a five mile radius could order from you. You know, and and what are the, what are the challenges and how did you navigate that? You know, particularly when you're looking at an inventory that you know eventually spoils. You know, the, it's it's a, a logistical nightmare in some yeah, way. Yeah. Inventory is not our. Uh not a challenge except uh you know we got to keep uh keep the trucks running but which became a challenge at some points uh you know our our biggest challenge um we had fortunately spent you know 2017 through 2019 investing in a lot of these technologies that were leading that way but until 2020 
you know, our third party partners, such as, you know, DoorDash, Uber Eats, uh, Grubhub, pick, pick a name, um, you know, they were, uh, I, we were reluctant to be in business with them because they were taking way more than our profit margin. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, they used to be a, of the attitude you couldn't pass on any kind of margin through to the customer. You had to charge the same price to the remote customers you did if they came in. And, you know, the, the economics of that have, have, are finally starting to come a bit more to an equilibrium. Um, you know, it's becoming commonplace now to charge a higher price tier for third-party delivery than for coming into the restaurant. And, and the consumers are not pr- as price sensitive in that market. It's a very different segment. But we saw a, a 64-fold increase in our third-party business from prior to pandemic to now uh, in, in weekly sales. So you know, we're definitely very much in that business. Um, we had the technology underpinnings, thank goodness. Uh, I would not have wanted to try to figure out how to do what was a 12-month project in the middle of the pandemic. Um, Build, building the airplane after it's taken off, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I know colleagues within the industry that were in that position, and um, it, it I, I didn't envy that. Um, but just, you know, the operational aspect of it, you know, you built this restaurant to serve a customer in front of you, and and the, the big the big moment for us was Cinco de Mayo last year, which Cinco de Mayo is, you know, always a, a good sales day if you're in the Mexican restaurant business. Um, but traditionally, uh, we were, you know, people people would go from work and they would come out to Salsaritas at lunch as a team, you know, at work and it'd be, a, you know, hey, let's go eat Mexican today because it's Cinco de Mayo. And the, so we had these huge lunch sales. We did lots of catering business on Cinco de Mayo. But at night, everyone went to the, the, the traditional sit-down Mexican restaurants that had the bars and margaritas and everything. And that's been our history. Well, this Cinco de Mayo 2020, the entire nation ordered online Mexican food. <laughs> um, and it happened across the board. Every single concept uh, that, that offered delivery Mexican on the night of Cinco de Mayo got killed. Uh, yeah. And we had to we had to turn off our online ordering at 6.30 that night because we had orders that were backing up till after we closed. Wow. Um, and, and, yeah, and, so, and so here we are, uh, you know, we just hit the 30 day, we have a, a 30 day clock here in the office of when Cinco de Mayo is and uh, we're, we're about a month out right now and we're trying to figure out what's gonna happen. Uh, you know, it's, I don't think it'll be exactly like last year cause you know, we're getting back into restaurants now, but you know, sit down restaurants, but you know, just trying to, pl- we're, we're, we're planning for everything. It's, it's like a, we're not going to be caught flat-footed this time, but we're, yeah. we're not exactly sure what direction we're running that day. Um, so we've got to be flexible. Wow. A, a good problem to have, but it's still a problem, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, it was, it was great, except there were, you know, crowds of people standing in our restaurants angry that their order wasn't ready. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, you can. I can see that if you if you if you've got that big a business and you, and then all of a sudden you're not able to meet customer expectations, that doesn't look good either. No, no, it's sorry, sorry about that. Wow, but I, <laughs> I was sitting here thinking, how how do you plan for this? Because again, you know, last year was an anomaly. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you know what to expect this year? It's it's um it's guesswork. It it is, and then you know all we're going to do is uh, staff up. Uh, I know I'll be uh, ready to drive catering orders around the city if uh, if needed, and um, we're just gonna. Uh, we think it's gonna be somewhere in between traditional and and what we experienced last year. I, I don't because not everybody's locked into their houses. I don't think we'll see the dinner crush that we saw last year. But uh, oh, I wish you the best with that. <laughs> it was, yeah, absolutely. What day, uh, what day is Cinco de Mayo this year? Uh, it is on a Friday this year. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, man. I got to work my store. Otherwise, I'd I'd throw on a salsa lita shirt and hat and go drive around. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. We uh, we could use. Oh, sorry. No, it's a it's a Wednesday this year, so that'll that'll. Uh... All right. I might be available. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's gonna be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I'd like to turn to the, the um, topic of, of sort of the labor market. Um, you know, I, Jeff, you talked about, you know, you've got your full timers. They seem, you know, dedicated, um, you know, part of the family. Um, you know, I've, I've heard anecdotally that, you know, some of the, the larger chains, I saw something in Business Insider recently that Taco Bell and McDonald's are struggling to find workers right now. And some folks have criticized the amount of um, unemployment benefits that the federal government has added to state unemployment benefits almost as an incentive to keep people from returning to work. 
um, a lot of a lot of moving pieces in the, in the labor market right now. And uh, I'm just I'm curious what your experiences have been, um, you know, as you as you've maintained as as you you know tried to position yourself for growth. Um, you know, Jeff, um, you know, uh, I'm I'm not sure in terms of your operation. Um, uh, you know how. How, how does the labor market um, look to you from your vantage point? Well, it, it, per, you know, personally, how it affected us really wasn't it really wasn't that um, big a deal. Uh, I, you know, just a, a story I can tell you is that you know one of one of our full time managers, um, significant other, had gotten laid off, and the comment was made was that they're you know they're making more money sitting at home than what we were paying them. And, and we weren't paying chump change either. You know, <laughs> we were definitely doing uh, above living wage, but we, we, you know, we offered, it's like, well, do you want to be laid off? And, and uh, cause you can make that kind of money sitting at home too. And, and what we appreciated in return was like, well, no, I, I want to be here. I want to contribute. I want, so I want to do something with my day rather than sitting at home. And those are the kind of people you want to look for. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we're going through an interview process, um, I'm not too concerned with what, you know, person's educational background is or what, what it is they know or what they think they know. Um, I, I'm concerned with what's in a person's heart. What kind of work ethic do you have? Um, are you willing to take coaching? Can we, you know, are we going to be able to teach you everything you know to be successful here? And are you going to care about the people that come in and, and need our help? Uh, I can't teach people how to care. I can teach them how to be successful in our business, but you know, caring's got to come from their heart, and that's what we're looking for in interview process. But I do think that, um, uh, you know, just an observation that we have not seen nearly, nearly the amount of applications for jobs uh, that we were seeing prior to all of this, um, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons for that. But I, I personally am disappointed that um, we're not, we're not getting the job applications in that we used to get. Uh, we're not conducting as many interviews as we used to. And, and I don't know if that's, um, you know, just because people don't want to work here. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I, I think it, it might have to do with the pandemic and people getting paid to stay home and not do anything. And, that, and that's disappointing. Yeah, for sure. Tim, Tim, what have you seen in terms of, of the hiring landscape? Sure. Um, I mean, it's, uh, and the funny thing about being a franchisor is, you know, so we operate our restaurants in four states, but our franchisees are operating in another dozen. One of the biggest challenges of this pandemic period has been, how regionally different the responses and consumer behavior and labor behavior and regulatory structure has been. That, that was one of our biggest frustrations is, you know, we're in Charlotte, which straddles the North Carolina, South Carolina line. And I got a restaurant A that has all these particular restrictions. And I got a restaurant five miles away in South Carolina that has a totally different set that looks completely different. Um, and the labor market's been that way too. Um, you know, some markets, I think we're impacted more than others. Um, here in Charlotte, uh, we're definitely struggling to acquire talent right now. Um, the, you know, I can't, I haven't yet wrapped my head around the reasons why. I mean, after the Great Recession, you know, there was definitely a spring back to the uh, labor market. And, you know, we were able to upgrade our talent and, and it was easy to find good people. Um, you know, we're not... I don't know if it's the, the you know somebody said to me the other day is like you know it's not like you can retire on fourteen hundred dollars. Um, I, I agree, um, but I think there's there's some of it is maybe a generational shift in the labor market because um, you know we'll schedule we'll do phone interviews with and schedule five interviews for management uh, you know the next day and maybe one of the five will actually show up. Wow. Um, and, you know, the ghosting experience has become very common. And uh, I don't know if. Um, Man, that's a frustration. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, and this, these are for management. These are for salaried, uh, benefited yeah. uh, positions. And um, we have not seen, you know, despite what the labor statistics say about <clears throat> you know, how many unemployed are out there. Um, uh, and, and we were expecting, you know, being in the, the fast casual segment of the restaurant industry, which is not as impacted as the full fine dining that, you know, we would have, we traditionally have had a trade off from managers at the full service end of the spectrum saying, you know what, I'm tired of closing the bar at 2am, I'm going to go work in the fast casual sector because I'll be home at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. That's been our, our appeal as an employer. Um, we have not seen that coming out of this the way that we did out of the Great Recession, which uh, I'm still kind of scratching my head over. 
Um, it's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it's a struggle though. Huh. Well, we'll have you back on when you when you crack that nut and and understand, <laughs> you know exactly what that dynamic. If I, is. if I crack that nut, I'll I'll be charging people for it. There you go. <laughs> in a book, man. You you and uh, was it uh, Robbins? You're the motivational speaker. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so you know, you, you touched on it. You know, the the end of the Great Recession uh, back in 08, 09, um, You know, we we saw a decades long you know, rise in the stock market as sort of this return to, to prosperity, you know, home prices stabilized, um, you know, unemployment had reached, uh, I, I think it was about 3% um, prior to uh, March of 2020. Um, a lot of people, and I, and I frankly, I'm, I'm enamored of the phrase, uh, the roaring 2020s, um, and this idea that there is uh, pent up demand right now. You know, I, I experience it um with some regularity where it's just you know my my kids say you know hey can we can we do takeout again and i'm just like you know what yes we can like you know can we can we do the batting cages because that feels safe right now let's get out there and you know as soon as i can get on a, a plane um you know i i personally and anecdotally have that um from your perspective as as you know running your your operations um you know jeff you mentioned that um from a sales perspective, just the bottom line, you guys are are on track um, to be beating 2019's numbers. I believe that's um, what you had said. Yeah. Um, you know, do you, do you feel like there there's a spring load, um, you know, in the economy right now? And are you are you thinking about inventory and hiring from that perspective? Uh. Well, yes and no. Um, we felt the springboard happening um, in first quarter of, of 2020. Uh, we we know we noticed um, significant buildup in the uh, the second half of, of uh, 2019 and leading into 2020. So um, we had we had built up uh, in, in spring, you know, prepared for a spring load, and then March, and then all of a sudden everything kind of fizzled. Uh, and you know, you know, but we, we you know we like I said we adjusted our sales. We we. Um, we made the the, uh, the adjustments we needed to to be in survival mode, but also made adjustments to put us in position to have a really good 2021 uh, when when things got back to normal. And you know we were starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. So yeah, I, I would say that we're probably um, yeah. I mean we, we're doing better than we did first first quarter of 2020 here in 2021. And I was ecstatic with those numbers. That's great. Um, but it, it it but again it really comes down to making sure that you you keep your fundamentals straight. Um, I, you know, I, I can't remember, I, I remember, I just, I joke, I joke with my staff because I've said it so many times recently about Vince Lombardi after winning the Super Bowl and walking into the locker room and going, gentlemen, this, this is a football. We're going to introduce you to football again. It's like, um, they're not trying to build on success. They keep going back to, uh, the foundation of what makes them successful. And that's what we need to keep doing too. Every now and then. Um, we just have to hit the reset button and remember what it was that made us who we are and stick and stick to the fundamentals of, of what built up, built us into a successful business. Absolutely. I, I hope that answers the question. No, I, I, forgot, I forgot to warn you. I have adult ADD and I can only focus for so long. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that I, I, I really, um, it's something that I, I've been sort of banging this drum for a while that um, you know, keeping your fundamentals and and being willing to to get rid of the stuff that that you know, get get rid of the flack, you know, but keep that essence, you know, the the thing that makes you successful, the thing that makes you who you are as as an organization, um, I think is so critical. And and if if there is a silver lining to this whole experience, it has been that call to really do some of that that inner inner work and, and looking inside and saying, hey, this this is the essence of our success. This is why we do this every day. Yeah. Um, I admire that. And, and, and I, I would have to agree. There probably is a little bit of a springboard. And I appreciate what Tim had to say. And I'm happy for him that that, that, that segment of his business is up 64%. That's phenomenal. Um, we're, we're seeing a great, you know, one of the things that we did too was we um, completely revamped our website and, and, uh, and, and uh, revamped our marketing uh, program and worked with some experts. Uh, on it and the amount of new people that we've been seeing over the last year is is um, significant so we're definitely uh, making ourselves known to people that probably never knew we existed and um, and as long as we're doing our job uh, 
by creating what, what I refer to as CFLs or customers for life, um, they're going to keep coming back. And the more new people we keep identifying and, and are finding us and we keep doing a great job, they're going to keep coming back and we'll just keep building. Love that. Um, Tim, what are you seeing in terms of, of repeat business and, and that new customer acquisition? Um, you know, do you feel like you guys are, are locked and loaded on a great third and fourth quarter? Um, I don't know. I, I, I definitely am always <clears throat> wary of, of, of predicting after last year. Sure. Uh, but um, I mean, our, our business model has been fundamentally changed by this. Um, you know, we are going to be in the, the business of, of selling food online permanently now. The, the question is, how much of that can we retain as we add back some of our traditional business? And I think that's what's going to determine the strength of the springboard. And I think it's going to be very um, segment by segment of the economy. I don't think you know, the roaring 20s, it seemed like everything was, uh, you know, the rising tide was raising all boats. I don't know if I buy that kind of uh, springboard effect from, from the 2020s, because, you know, if you look at, at commercial real estate, you know, the last shoe has not fallen there. People are not going back to their offices. So I think there are going to be some segments of the economy that, and I'm sorry, I'm a, I am an economics geek, can't help it. Um, the, um, you know, there are going to be set certain segments of the economy that don't, that, have, that, are, that are fundamentally changed forever. We were fundamentally changed forever. We could adapt quickly. I don't know that, you know, again, to pick on commercial real estate, I don't think they're in that same boat. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't, there's, you know, there's gonna be a lot of office buildings converted to something else. I don't know what, but um, they're gonna have to find a use. Organic for farms, I hear. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, but um, you know, I think the, the because it it forced us to change our business model, you know, in very fundamental ways. Um, you know, we're building restaurants differently now than we would have a year ago. We're we've got drive through uh, on them. We're you know rethinking our parking lots. We're um, rethinking um our delivery footprints uh we're really you know rethinking our availability on on these online platforms we consider the online platforms partners now as opposed to enemies <laughs> it's uh it's a very different uh world and i think the the ability to catch a springboard is going to come out of those that adapted to um what changed and can continue to keep that as they add back whatever was the old normal uh, to the extent that the customers want it. Um, and we, that may be the biggest unknown is, is, you know, is there a generation of people now that really just prefer takeout and they're not in love with the, the sense of going to a restaurant. If that's the case, then that's, you know, more worrisome than it is helpful. Sure. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. Maybe there's maybe there's a way to to, uh, to market in such a way to romanticize the eating out again, uh, you know, draw draw the couples in. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely where the the, the full service guys are heading. Um, you know, we're we're uh, we're on the convenience end of the spectrum, uh, so we're you know we're focusing on on lunch business more. But uh, um, yeah, family night out uh, is is has changed. The question is, is it going to go back? Uh, yeah. And I there's different different segments of our industry that are betting on different outcomes <laughs> well, I, I, well, hey, on that note if you don't mind my asking where do you what do you predict happening with brick and mortar um retail in terms of uh uh the, the um rents um you know for, so for example uh business that might have some leases that need to be re-upped asking for a friend of course yeah um, sure uh, and, and how would you how would somebody say in my in my position that's got some leases that are due to um uh need to re-up the next year or two what what advice would you give in terms of negotiating are they are they gonna, are they going to be amenable to maybe uh, charging lesser rent or giving more uh more comps i i personally feel like and then i have no professional uh credentials here but I feel like time is on, and I'm in that same position. I've got several restaurant leases that need to be, you know, I've got restaurant leases that are in renewal at, at all points. And if I didn't, my franchisees do, and they come to me. Um, time is on the the tenant side right now, I think, because I really don't feel like um, retail, the office space has certainly felt the pain, but even that hasn't washed through yet. Mm -hmm. And And I think retail 
um, is hoping that this thing is all going to go away. And then, you know, we can just say next year that, uh, you know, well, that, well, that was, that was 2020's problem or 2021's problem, but 2022 on forward is, you know, is just an ever increasing, uh, rent schedule. And, and I'm, I'm particularly in the restaurant sector, I'm trying to hold a hard line with, with some of my landlords because, you know, I'm like, Hey, let's talk again in four months and see how many more of your tenants have closed. Um, and, you know, yeah. uh, but I, I think that's the kind of conversation we're trying to have. Um, but, you know, and it's, and it's market by market. There's some markets that, you know, more people have come around to seeing that, you know, hey, we got to change the nature of this relationship. But, you know, I've got other landlords, particularly the, the large, you know, REIT held properties that are like, well, no, we bought it for this value. So it has to be worth at least more than that. And it's like, well, yeah. you know, something fundamentally changed here, you know, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, we're, but I, I and, and, and real estate's just such a lagging indicator. Like it's, it's just because everything is set in five and 10 year and 20 year terms, it, it takes a longer time for that kind of stuff to react. And I've, right. I've seen very little reaction so far, but I can't wrap my head around the idea that there's not going to be any reaction. Uh, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. That's, um, I appreciate you sort of going in on, on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I might be completely wrong too, so. <laughs> right, you know, and th there's there's the lesson learned from 2020 is that, you know, try as we might, um, the best predictions often fail. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I want to be um, considerate of, of everybody's time and we're getting close to that noon hour. Um, you know, I, I think that, that you each have really brought up um, some interesting perspectives in terms of, you know, sticking to your fundamentals, you know, really knowing who you are as a business and who you serve and recognizing that the reason you're in business is, is to help someone, is to provide them with that unique experience. Um, and when you, when you strip away the bells and whistles of, you know, iPad ordering systems or, you know, whatever thing comes along, there, there's an essential service that you provide and it, it's, it's quality customer service, quality product, quality food, um, and people will come back to that. Um, it may not look exactly the same as it did in 2019, um, but but if that core is still there, um, you know I think you guys and and folks in our you know our client base and and, and in our audience today um, can look forward to to more years of success. Um, before we wrap up, I always like to to ask folks if they have um, sort of I, I call it your pandemic story. You know, in five years we'll look back on on this time period and and some things will. You know, some things will, will blend into the background, but other things, you know, will stand out as a moment where, you know, perhaps there was hope, perhaps there was um, something new you figured out about your business that that you wouldn't have otherwise. And so, uh, Jeff, if, if I could turn to you, you know, any any positive takeaways um, from this past year that that give you give you a reason to get up in the morning these days? Well, I mean, I don't necessarily know that I needed anything this, this, this life experience to, to make me want to get up in the morning. I kind of had that motivation and, and zip to begin with. And, um, and I can tell you that it, it, we have to create that for ourselves. Um, we don't necessarily have to um, have, you know, life, life altering things happen outside, outside of it. I mean, I was asked this question recently by, you know, the, the uh, running industry board of directors and, you know, I just remember been in this business long enough to remember the effect that 9-11 um, had, you know, where we were when, when the Pentagon was hit and people's reaction in our, in our area to that. Um, we had to deal with the reaction uh, that our, our communities had to the DC sniper was terrorizing I-95. Yeah. Um, you know, Tim had talked about the, uh, the economic collapse back in 2008. I mean, all of those things were life-changing. Um, and you just got to do the best you can. You, you, have to, you have to give yourself motivation to want to get up in the morning. So from that standpoint, I don't really look at 2020 as any different than any other, um, I guess, you know, societal tragedy that we've ever had to live through. Um, but I'm sure that at some point we're going to look back at this. And, and, uh, and honestly, I think my wife and I are going to be very proud of the decisions that we made. Um, we're going to, you know, we talk about everything. Uh, we constantly have a contingency plan. 
um, you know, if this, if this is, if this happens, how are we going to handle it? Well, if this happens and then we'll do this and we'll do that. I mean, we're constantly thinking of, of how to move forward, analyzing things that we've, we've done well and if, analyzing our mistakes, what we would have done differently. Um, so, f- you know, from that standpoint, I mean, I, you know, we always look back and, and, and uh, hopefully look back on things finally and lessons learned. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think, um, 2020 in, in my life is going to be any different than anything else we've ever had to live through. So I, I love that positivity. I think that's, that's a, a great message, um, sort of carry forth, um, you know, Tim, you know, any, any positive takeaways or, or lessons learned um, from the um, last year? Sure. Uh, you know, and I, I have to admit being in the fast casual end of the industry, you know, we were in a, you know, we were on the fortunate side of a, of a bad place to be during this kind of activity. Uh, you know, I, I, I have to acknowledge that, you know, one in four restaurants in this country is closed permanently. Uh, and, and that's been a, a real loss to a lot of people and a lot of, you know, a lot of my friends and, and coworkers. Um, but if I think of, you know, bright silver linings that have, have changed, uh, you know, we're a franchisor, we work with, with entrepreneurs, you know, around the country who own their own businesses. They just, they call them salseritas, but it's their business, it's their employees. And one of the things that I think is fundamentally changed for the good is that, you know, a year or two years ago, uh, our franchisees generally considered, you know, technology expenditure to be, you know, a, a, a wasteful spend that, you know, kept going up, but, you know, didn't deliver on its promises. And, and it was a, you know, a, a unwelcome line item in the, uh, the P&L. And I think, now our, our franchisees are leaning into technology instead of me having to tell them what's coming down the road. They're calling saying, hey, have you heard about this new thing? Have you heard about what's going on here? Is that something we can use? They're really leaning in on technology. And I think the biggest change is we've realized, you know, we're all in the technology business now. Uh, it's not, there's no, and, and you know, to, to say that to a big box retailer, you know, I should have told them 10 years ago, but, you know, for our sec- our industry, you know, we're really, uh, restaurants are in the technology business now, and we can't pretend it's happening out there without us. Um, so we, we got to be in the game. And uh, our, our community now understands that and really leans into um, what do we have to do to be ready for the next thing. And I guess that's a, that's a welcome mindset <laughs> for me. Sure. Well, gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for spending an hour with me today. Um, the perspective and insight has been super valuable. Um, hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Um, Jeff, real quick before we close it out, how can folks connect with uh, Lucky Road Run Shop? Uh, uh, well, uh, luckyroadrunshop.com, obviously. Um, we've got uh, Facebook pages and Google pages for all three different locations. But um, yeah, just look up Lucky Road Run Shop. Love it. And thank, uh, thank you for that plug, by the way. Yeah, of course. You know, um, Tim, you know, if, if I'm hungry in the uh, in the Charlotte area, um, you know, what's the easiest way to get to get some salsaritas in my uh, hands? Uh, you know, any of your social medias, but salsaritas.com will show us your closest location to you uh, in any of the 17 states. So uh, hope to hope to see you soon. Love it. Well, guys, thank you again. I really enjoyed this. Um, Best of luck to you in, uh, you know, the rest of this year and and, uh, to your future success. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Everybody out there in our audience, we appreciate you joining today. My name is Kevin Wilson, and this has been The Beacon. Um, I hope that you will uh, tune back in. Come to dominionpayroll.com and uh, hit that resource button at the top of the page where you can see all of our upcoming webinars and I hope that you will join us again. Um, That being said, everybody have a great Wednesday, have a great rest of the week um, and cheers.